And I'm going to start with an example of improvisation, but not improvising medicine. I'm going to start with a, a musical example. So here on the screen we see a duo, a very experienced, very expert duo of a, a pianist and a cellist who are going to be playing in a public performance three fantasy pieces by Robert Schumann. But before they start, they're doing something very unusual. They're going to improvise a prelude. And we're going to join them for that first one minute or so of their performance as they come together to play something they've never played before in preparation for pieces that have been written by uh, an eminent composer. And so although it would be lovely to hear the rest of their recital, we haven't got time for that this evening. Um, and so we're going to leave it there for a moment, although we'll come back to this duo a, a little later. And so here we have two very individually, very expert performers coming together to do something collaboratively, something they haven't done before, something that is improvised in the moment. And that's what this lecture is going to be about. So I lead the Centre for Engagement and, S and Simulation Science at Imperial College London. I also jointly um, lead the Centre for Performance Science between Imperial College and um, the Royal College of Music with my colleague Aaron Williamon. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the South Kensington part of London, the Royal College of Music is just around the corner from the Science Museum, um, the V&A and indeed Imperial College. Um, and we've been exploring ideas of, uh, of performance from different points of view. So in some of my earlier Gresham lectures, I started to explore the idea of medicine, not only as science, of course it consists in need science, not only of component skills, but of performance. And that the clinical consultation takes place as an intersection between those three areas. But as a patient, it's the performance that we see most clearly. So I'm going to now look at an example of medical performance as a kind of counterpoint to the musical example I started off with. And I'm going to take you for a moment to the operating theatre. Now, um, in the first part of my career, I trained as a, as a surgeon, a trauma surgeon. And for a long time, I, I saw the operating theatre like this, as a site of the application of scientific knowledge to make individual sick people better. So my focus of attention um, when I was operating would be that patient on the operating table with that injury or that disease. Um, and so when we look here, we see a typical surgical team. In the middle of the picture is the, is the primary surgeon. She's, uh, she's looking out towards us. Opposite her is her first assistant. On the left of the screen, as we look at it, is the scrub nurse in charge of looking after the instruments, the equipment. At the top um, of the, uh, the patient's head is the anaesthetist, making sure the patient is, is asleep and, and safe. And then another uh, member of the team on, on the right. And so looking at it as the site of the application of scientific knowledge is one way of seeing it. But more and more recently, I've been thinking that what you see depends very much on what you look for. So like this well-known image, which you can see as a as a duck looking to the left, or you can see it as a rabbit looking to the right, what you choose to see depends on you. 
You can see it as a duck, you can see it as a rabbit, you can flip between the two. You can't easily have a, a mishmash, an amalgam that's, that's both at the same time, but you can flip. And so when we join that team, as we're going to just for a few minutes now, to see how they begin an operation, we can look at, we can notice various things. We're going to see them as they begin a procedure to find out what's wrong with a patient who's been injured. There's a bit of blood in here, actually, so let's pack the four quadrants. Okay, oh dear, quite a lot of blood swelling up here. Don't worry, that's the retractor, so we'll get that back inside so we can see what we're doing. We'll really touch the suction, right? Underneath so we'll there. Muscle. there. Okay, can I have suction on, please? Okay, okay, all right, and let's pack again, oh, please. Try to get in. And so although, although this seems a million miles away in many ways from the two musicians I started off with, in other ways there are strong similarities because here again we have a group of people who are doing something which once they've started they have to carry on however it goes. Um, high stakes, they are bringing individual skills, they're reading one another without necessarily talking or seeing one another directly. And if we were to look at this, not from, from the side as we are in this picture, but from above, if we were to be on the ceiling of the operating theatre looking down, we might see something like this. We might see a, a sort of almost unconscious ballet of hands, people, uh, people's hands and instruments coming together in a coordinated way to respond to one another's movements often without even recognising it. Improvisation. And, and although people often feel uncomfortable at the, at the idea of improvisation in surgery, in some forms of surgery particularly, improvisation is not the exception, it's the norm. So this is a photograph from an operation I was doing in the 1980s when I was working in Soweto in southern Africa um, at a big hospital called Baraguanas, that's me over there on the right with a beard, um, dealing with the kind of surgery that was routine at that stage where people would come in often very sick. They'd been perhaps run over but more often they'd been, they'd been stabbed or, or even shot or blown up. And so although as a surgical team we knew um, the basics of what we were going to do, we were going to open a patient up once they were anaesthetised, we were going to find out what was wrong. There was much that we knew we couldn't know until we started. There was, there was stuff that we just simply couldn't tell until we opened up that patient, what had been injured, what needed to be done to put it right. There was, there was never not improvisation in that kind of surgery. And I think, to a greater or lesser extent, that applies to almost every kind of medicine because you're always dealing with a... Uh, a, a, a person, even if you're doing the same sort of thing to the same person on another occasion, it's never the same. There is always improvisation. I've been spending a lot of time recently thinking about what it is then to become expert. Um, in one of my earlier Gresham lectures, I, 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 I pointed out a, a, a sort of progression, if you like, that at its simplest is probably familiar to most of us. The, the, the medieval guild system approach, where you start off as an apprentice knowing nothing in a master's workshop, doing what you're told without even understanding what it is necessarily. Then as you become more experienced, you leave the workshop, you become independent, you go out into the outside world as a journeyman, you ply your craft or your trade or your profession, um, and then eventually, later on in your career, you too become a master, and the wheel comes full circle. You have apprentices of your own, you too have people following in your footsteps. And I think this is a useful model as a sort of overview, but I don't think it really covers all the stages. Um, so I think in that, in that early stage of, of being a, uh, an apprentice, you're spending time, lots of time, just doing stuff, stuff that other people tell you you have to do. But in that process, even though you may not particularly like it, you may find it boring, you are learning to look and to pay attention and to spend time with your materials and with other people, and to work in the space of the workshop where you're in. Then later on you become, uh, you become a journeyman, you become independent, and I think a couple of pivotal shifts have to take place there. The first one is that you have to move your attention or focus from you, yourself, and all those things you're struggling to learn, to whoever it is your work is for, for your audience, or your patient, or your client, or your customer. But at the same time, you have to take responsibility for developing your own individuality, your style, your, your voice. Um, and then, as you become a master, you, your responsibility changes. It's then not only to your customers, your audience, your patients, but to the people who are coming after you, your apprentices. 
And I think particularly throughout, but particularly in that middle stage, that journeyman stage, learning to improvise, it, it becomes more and more important. And yet, as I said at, at the beginning, improvisation is a word which has, it often has pejorative overtones. It sounds like something made up on the spur of the moment or a bit lazy or bluffing, perhaps. But I don't think it is. I think improvisation, on the contrary, is the very highest form of art. And I'm going to, I'm going to draw now on, on the work of, um, of David Pye, who is a, a well-known furniture designer in the 1960s, was at the Royal College of Art. Um, and he talks, interestingly, about the workmanship of risk and the workmanship of certainty, which I think goes to the heart of what improvisation is about. So I'm going to, I'm going to read just a couple of paragraphs from, um, from, from his book. So he says, if I must ascribe a meaning to the word craftsmanship, I shall say as a first approximation that it means simply workmanship using any kind of technique or apparatus in which the quality of the result is not predetermined but depends on the judgment, dexterity and care which the maker exercises as he works. The essential idea is that the quality of the result is continually at risk during the process of making. And so I shall call this kind of workmanship the workmanship of risk, an uncouth phrase but at least descriptive. In workmanship, the care counts for more than the judgment and dexterity, though care may well become habitual and unconscious. With the workmanship of risk, Pai continues, we may contrast the workmanship of certainty, always to be found in quantity production and found in its pure state in full automation. In workmanship of this sort, the quality of the result is exactly predetermined before a single saleable thing is made. The most typical and familiar example of the workmanship of risk is writing with a pen. And of the workmanship of certainty, modern printing. In principle, the distinction between the two different kinds of workmanship is clear and turns on the question, is the result predetermined and unalterable once production begins? And I think that goes to the heart of what we're talking about here because in, in both that medical example and that musical example, the result was not predetermined before the process begins. It was something that took shape as it was happening. I think it's worth pointing out that, that Pi in the 1960s used the word risk in a different sense from how we might use it today. We're not talking about risk of, of, of damage or financial risk or any of the other risks we, we talk about a lot. We're talking about that sense of, of uncertainty. And I think um, it ties in to what another sort of guru of, of, of improvisation um, talked about in the context of the theatre. And this is Keith Johnston, Johnston um, whose work you, you may know. Keith Johnston was a theatre director in the 1960s and 70s and beyond. Um, very powerful influence. And he spent a lot of time teaching actors to uh, improvise in workshops in this country and, and all over Europe and beyond. And one of his central ideas was that if you have a pair of actors, um, each one of them should respond to the other in a way that allowed the performance to continue and to develop. So whatever somebody came up with, the other person should come up with something that allowed things to move on in a spirit of generosity and open-mindedness. So one actor might start off by saying, I don't know, might just be thinking for an idea, and he might say, oh, I've just, um, I've just let myself down on uh, a long piece of thread from, from, from Jupiter. And the other one might, at the beginning, before we'd learnt the technique, might say, well, that's impossible because you can't come down from Jupiter on a piece of string. And that would be a, a yes, but response, which shuts down further improvisation. Whereas what Keith Johnston was saying is whatever somebody offers you, you must respond to it. So the other person might say, well, that's interesting because I've just come down from Mars on a, on, a, on a parachute. And then the next one would go and so on and so on. And so each one would be feeding positively on what the other one had said. And that would allow the performance to develop and grow in directions that neither of them could predict. But they would both be confident that whatever they did, they would be supported in a yes and um, way. And I think we see that. Um, we see that in, in most forms of improvisation and certainly in all successful forms of improvisation. But, but this doesn't just come out of nowhere, this ability to improvise. It's, it's based on years and years and years of individual practice 
and collective practice. Um, so I'm going to show you a brief glimpse of something I, I, I showed in a different context in another lecture here, which is a group of surgeons, a surgical team, um, taking out a gallbladder. It's actually a simulation of a gallbladder, so those of you who are at all squeamish, don't worry. Um, but I'm going to show you just at the first few moments of, a, of an operation and then explain what's going on. And now this is interesting. And in this... So if we just pause that for the moment, in the centre of the screen there is the operating surgeon, very distinguished surgeon, Harold Ellis. Um, and on the left of the screen, as we, as we see it, is his, uh, his colleague, um, Sister Mary Neeland. And they've worked together for, um, for decades. On the other side of the picture, we've got some less experienced assistants. And so when we pick up this very brief clip, I want you to look at what's happening in the space between the surgeon in the middle and the scrub nurse on the left. Yes, the artery is running with it. In man, the artery is separate for in mankind, men and women. The artery runs separate for it. But here you can see, I just have a scissor. You can see. And so, so we see the surgeon putting out his hand, and the the, the theatre sister, who who doesn't appear to have been focusing particularly on what he's doing, has clearly already got ready the instrument that she knows he's going to need, and she hands it to him, and he takes it. But if you slow this down, you find that it's even more interesting than that because the sequence of events goes like this. He puts out his hand, she puts the scissors in it, he retracts his hand and starts using them, and then he says, scissors, please, <laughs> after it's happened. And so all of this is happening below conscious awareness. And when we played this video back to these people, they had no idea that any of this was happening. So I think what, what we're looking at here is one of the building blocks of improvisation, one of the cornerstones, which is having put in the work and the time that allows you to be able to work with confidence with other people, knowing that they will be able to respond to you with a yes and, whether it's at a, at a conscious level in terms of dialogue or whether it's at a sort of internal embodied level in terms of what they do. And so... Before I finish this first part of the lecture, I'm just going to take you back again to uh, a, another, another moment in that uh, performance by the, by the duo we saw earlier. So um, they've played, they're getting to the end of the second of Schumann's three fantasy pieces. And when we start the, um, the video in a moment, we'll, we'll see them get to the end, and then they are going to improvise again for a minute or so. They're going to improvise a, 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 an interlude, a bridging piece, that will take them onto the third and final fantasy piece. We won't have time to hear all that, but we'll have a look at the inter interlude. And um, if you look at the page turner who's, uh, who's there behind the pianist, you'll see that he um, takes away and then restores the, the score, the written music, to, to mark the time when the duo are improvising. To, to leave the final fantasy piece. So there we saw these musicians 
improvising in a slightly different way because by now they've already played two of those pieces. It's not the prelude that we saw them start off with. They've been immersed in that music and they are improvising with one another, something that leads to something that they both know they're going to play, but they haven't um, experienced that, that bridging piece that we've just, that we've just heard. So, so I've tried to point out, just to set the scene here, that there are, um, there are elements of improvisation in both music and medicine, that I think there are more than we might at first suppose. Um, and uh, in order to explore that idea further, we're going to move to the second half of the lecture. And so now I'm going to introduce my guest for the rest of this lecture. He's the pianist whom you saw in that brief clip. He's, uh, he's an international recitalist who's performed all over the world, including the Wigmore Hall and the Royal Festival Hall in London, the Concertgebouw in Amsterdam, and he teaches and gives master classes at leading music institutions worldwide, including the Yehudi Menuhin School, where he was invited to teach by Yehudi Menuhin himself and is on the staff. He heads the Centre for Creative Performance and Classical Improvisation, at the Guildhall School of Music and Drama in London, where he's Professor of Classical Information, uh, Improvisation, Professor of Classical Improvisation. And so it's my great pleasure to introduce David Dolan. So, David, welcome to this Thank special you. lecture. Um, so, maybe just, just say a few words about about what it is that you do, because it's quite unusual, isn't it? Well, apparently I'm doing this, and watching that now, <laughs> which I haven't done for a long time, I got frightened <laughs> from the risks we threw at, at each other, so it's, it's good to throw yourself into it straight away. I'm a musician, a uh, pianist. Um, I've been interested in improvisation from very early on. I think that uh, my piano teacher realized that I hardly read notes when I turned the page at the wrong place uh, after two years or something, which was a big scandal with my parents and etc. But uh, so I didn't know that I was applying improvisation. Um, and I'm lucky to be surrounded by wonderful partners, both students and colleagues and researchers. Uh, we'll come to it perhaps a bit later, but uh, I'm looking to the phenomenon of improvisation, first of all, b by doing it in, mm. in concerts and teaching it, but also researching several aspects of it. So, so before we go any further, could you give us an example, a live example? A live of, example. Of improvisation. Okay. <laughs> uh, so that will be an example of improvising within repertoire, which was a very common practice up until the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, still is in the world of jazz, of course, and in many non-Western art musics. But I'm going to do something that was a very common practice. Uh, because of time, I will do only the first half of the theme of the Goldberg Variations by Bach, the aria that opens it, which I'll, I'll play twice. Once it's, it's written, which is already slightly uh, embellished, and then I will repeat it uh, with less slightly embellished. Um, and apropos the yes but, according to whatever will happen in what part, that will, that will decide for the story how it continues, I hope. Uh, so first time, first half as written, repeated with maybe, or not, I don't know, a bridge between, uh, elaborated. Thank you. 
you're starting off with a piece of music, I can see it on the, on the piano there, written by the great man, written by Bach. Um, and, and, and you played that first of all, but then you played it again. And, and was it Bach that time, or was it Dolan, or was it, what was it? <laughs> That's a very hot potato question. It was Bach, it was absolutely Bach. Uh, and just as in a storytelling situation or a development of a narrative, when you repeat something, there is a reason as far as the story and the development is concerned, which is, that, that's what I've done. I, I, I repeated it as, as one does. Uh, that's not my decision to repeat, it's Bach decision. Uh, but there is no such thing as repeat in the sense of duplication. You, when you say something for the second time, the story is already there. And so I suppose that goes back to, to, to what was happening when we saw you in that, in that duo with the cellist. In a way, yes. Uh, the duo here wasn't a duo, it was a solo, but a solo. more than one line is happening. Yes. So, 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 so if you were to play that again now, that, that, that aria, it would be different again, presumably, yes, if you were to improvise. Yes, absolutely. So, Otherwise, I'm cheating. So... so and what I'm trying to get at, I suppose, is to what extent do you have a sense of how you might improvise, or does it just, does a, a muse land on your desk at that moment and you just kind of do it? No, it's not. It's a, it's a combining business and pleasure, although we are told that you shouldn't do things like that. <laughs> business being the structure underneath, and when I learn it, as I learn most tonal music and also non-tonal, but differently, I learn the structure of it. The structure of it, I mean, um, and you can uh, you can tell the story of the structure in more than one way. So. Uh, So you've got to have a sense, a deep understanding of what that fundamental structure of the piece of music is before you can do things with yes. it, or things around it. Is that, is that true? Absolutely. And this, the structure we are talking about, sometimes the word may be misleading, is not a, a, a frozen thing because music lives in the flow of time. Mm. So it's the movement between the elements, the tension release, the, the, the short and the mid and the longer term um, relations and choreography of the... So it's not just, it's not just the, the chords or the keys, no, it's, 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 it's much more than that. Because I was thinking about par parallels with my own experience in, as I mentioned, I was a trauma surgeon and, and um, well, any surgery, I suppose, you, you have a general idea of what the structure is because you've studied anatomy and everything and you, you go to do an operation on somebody's stomach, say, and you know where their stomach's going to be and roughly what it's going to look like and what its connections are in its blood vessels and things. But everybody's stomach is different and, and you can't know for certain exactly what it's going to be like or what it's going to be stuck down to or, or what it's going to feel like or, or, or what its consistency is. There's a whole lot you can't know. But you do have to know, you have to have done your homework and learnt about stomachs in general and, and where they sit anatomically and all those things. And that has to be in your head. I don't think there's a shortcut. You can't just suddenly approach a human being with no idea what you're going to find and expect to be effective. And I, I guess there's something like that with what you're saying. Yes, except I must say that I feel a bit uh, humbled when you put these two together because if I make a mistake and I can't get out of it, I, I made a very... Well, unpleasant harmonic phrase. Well, maybe later we can talk about how you get out of things you wish you hadn't got into, but, yes. uh, <laughs> but let's, let's leave that for the moment and, and just talk about this idea of, of structure because it seems to me that part of your expertise is obviously being able to play and, and having a lot of experience, but it's, it goes deeper than that, doesn't it? It's, it's yes. this ability to go to the, to the core of what it is that you're improvising around. To internalise it, to, to feel the, that you, you're at home in this structural phenomenon and then move in it or tell, tell the story of the event moving from one point to the other point differently. Because I, I, I gather 
for, from what you've said before that that there are different kinds of I mean here is a sort of improvisation where you're starting with something that's been written by somebody else yes. but when we saw you in that duo you were starting with something that hadn't been written by somebody else but it wasn't completely disconnected because you knew it was leading up to those pieces of yes. music by Schumann we had so, one so it's not quite the same as this is it no it's not. We had one agreement, which is on what harmony we finish, because we knew that we start in A minor, so we agreed that we would finish on the chord that bleeds there, the dominant of it, we call it. Uh, that's the only thing we knew. And, and so was yours a, a yes and? Yes, absolutely. And, and I, I was horrified to hear it now, how many occasions we gave each other. I think I was nastier than Thomas and gave him very strong, uh, you know, opportunities to apply yes and. So, uh, so this, this is Thomas Carroll, your, your, yes. your, your colleague, the, the cellist. And so you, you must, rather like the scrub nurse and the surgeon, you must know one another pretty well musically, I guess. Very, very well. He was many, many lives ago a student of mine. One of the people Yehudi Menuhin was testing me on, he, he heard me in Paris and said, I'd like to see whether you can teach it and uh, asked me to work with a string quartet where he was then a 17 years old, super brilliant with the international beginning of career already. And Yehudi told me, if you survive this quartet, we should talk. Uh, <laughs> and you must have survived it. Because yes. here you are. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. So, so maybe you could give us another example then of, of, about this whole idea of, of how you might approach improvising. Okay, so I will invite you all inside the kitchen and uh, shall we do an example of uh, how we work with my students, with myself on different... And I will take the first prelude of Bach from the first book of the World Tempered Clavier that I'm sure many of you know. That's the first harmonic phrase. Second. Going out from the key, etc., etc. So, apropos making oneself at home in the structure, I will now, uh, I don't know, maybe it will sound ridiculous to, to an expert medical authority, if I said that I will look for the skeleton of it, which means I will simply let the harmonies come as chord, chord progression that moves forward, which gives these. the skeleton of the whole thing. So far I am hiding behind the very large wings of Bach. If I, when, when I try to make myself really feeling at home with the language and, and with, with the, what this allows, prelude used to be a form of improvising. Prelude, uh, preludion, uh, was a word that was used by musicians to say improvise before a strict form comes. I will now go back to this uh, chord progression. Um, and at least at the beginning, I will still keep myself safe within the Bach uh, chord progression. Then I may look for troubles as we were talking and share with you whether it's a yes and or yes, but I lost it. Um, and I will try to go back at the, at the end of it uh, as Bach does. So I will start as Bach starts. I will perhaps go somewhere else in the middle and back home. And I will do it not as chord progression, but as a movement of voices. Um... 
were taking us into the kitchen. You were showing us a few things. Very much so. And because I was aware of, of sharing with you the process, I think that had that been in a class with some of my wonderful students and it would be something one of my students had done, I would have two or three or four things to say. Uh, so about about how to what sort of things would you would, would you be saying to, to make it more refined right. more, more mm -hmm. flowing more in, in coherently in the language but but that's a part of, of improvise you yeah. throw yourself within a structural idea now the middle was indeed out of the comfort zone of Bach um, and here there is a lot of yes and mm -hmm. between me and myself yes. Well, I thought that was, uh, there's an interesting parallel there, I think, also in my own experience with what happens in a, in a consultation with a patient. Because after I finished training as a surgeon, I, I changed direction and I became a GP, a family doctor, family physician, and um, spent a lot of time, of course, uh, seeing patients for perhaps 10 minutes at a time, maybe even less. Um, and there I was, I think, I was improvising a lot more than I realised to begin with. In fact, I was improvising all the time. But there was an interesting, I think there was a two-way relationship between the, the, the stuff that I'd learnt at medical school and after that about diseases and classifications and could it be pneumonia, could it be whatever. Um, and then, which maybe is a bit like the structure that you were talking about. And then what actually happened when I was with people is that they never ha had whatever the books <laughs> described because it was always different. Um, but by doing it a lot of times, not only did I become better at spotting uh, unusual or atypical examples of, of what the textbooks described, but I also had a, a richer understanding of what it was that the textbooks were describing by experiencing that in different forms and different variations and different manifestations, if you like, if that makes sense. And so I, I think I got a, a, a better understanding of what pneumonia might look like, or appendicitis or something. Uh, and I was better at recognising it and, and dealing with it. And I wondered if there was something in that to and fro. I mean, by doing that in the way that you do, does that give you a different understanding of what Bach wrote? I dare thinking that the answer is yes, because the idea is not to, it's not to enhance one's ego, on the contrary. Mm -hmm. It's to serve this coming from, you know, a divine zone, music better. Uh, which means that the, the, the harmonic structure, which, is, which, which we conceptualize very often as a vertical business, becomes something with movement. So it's both vertical and horizontal, and you melt down the barriers between this. Um, and you, you discover different possible manifestations of the same structure. Because we started off by saying that the, these, these music and medicine, I think, in a way, they're never not improvising. But, 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 but things have changed, haven't they, in the world of classical improvisation? It used to be much more accepted than it is now. It, it, we are actually in the process of, I think, we are allowed to say, a renaissance of this concept, because... Classical music had improvisation as a part of its practice the same way as jazz music is nowadays up until more or less World War I. When it comes to composers, they begin to leave less room for improvisation late in the 19th century. Uh, you can say that in late Beethoven there is little, very little room for the performer to, to improvise early Beethoven a lot. Uh, but performers kept... Uh, this practice up until, as I said, more or less World War I. And in recent years, there is a, a renaissance of it, both when it comes to the practice, teaching, and, and research. I'm, I'm very, very lucky to uh, have the ability to collaborate with people like John Sloboda, a colleague of mine at the Guildhall, professor of research, and a team from Imperial College, mm -hmm. led by Professor Henrik Jensen, for the last 10 years. and, and in the last phase of the research, we, <clears throat> I think, uh, managed to suggest or to establish <clears throat> excuse me, the possibility that there is such, such thing as an improvisational state of mind in which the brain functions differently. And so by improvisational state of mind, what, what does that feel like? How, how do you know that you're 
Uh, okay. Uh, it feels like being in a state of flow, as Chiksan Mihai yeah. determines it, when one loses the sense of uh, time and, and self-awareness. And, and, and so is this, is this a, a case of, of having to have all those skills and all that experience that then kind of comes out almost without you being aware of it? Is it one of those yeah, things? it's a part of it, yes, absolutely. I've, I mean, I've heard surgeons talk about that as well, and in fact I've experienced it myself from time to time, where things just seem to go right, and you don't quite know, but all of a by sudden... By themselves. By themselves, and all of a sudden, you know, two hours have gone by and, and it, it all exactly. looks beautiful. Uh, I mean, most of the time it isn't like that, it's effortful and, and sort of something you do consciously, but sometimes, and I guess most people in some area of their life have had that experience of flow. And yeah. it sounds to me as if that's what you're talking about. Is it? Yes, but channeled, not yes, but yes, and <laughs> channeled into this quite complex business of, of dealing with a complicated structure and component and a work that you spend many, many, many hours learning and, and studying inside out, instrumentally and, and, and musically. And then you, you leave the hard work behind. Yeah, and that, that makes sense to me too. For, again, as a, as a GP, I would sometimes feel that, you know, I would try and listen to what somebody was saying, and, but I wouldn't be saying that there's these three symptoms and those four tests make that diagnosis. I would just suddenly kind of have a sense that what was wrong was this. And, and sometimes, I, I, sometimes it was, and that was a very satisfying feeling because I, I had lost sight of the steps that led up to that. It just kind of fell into place. And it didn't happen always. In fact, it didn't happen very often. But when it did, I had the sense of practicing in a different way from, from that effortful um, gathering information and, and, and churning wheels and then coming up with, a, with an answer. It was a different process, I thought. That sounds familiar. That sounds familiar. Thank God for the patients, not, not from the medical yeah. side. But, uh, you know, when you improvise a cadenza for a concerto and you have to land at a very certain key and some, some, suddenly you find yourself in a very, very remote key. So it's so a cadenza, for people who are not familiar with it, that's a sort of improvised bit in the middle of something that's been written down. It's a moment right? towards the end of the uh, concerto movement where the orchestra leaves you alone and you improvise uh, a minute, a minute and a half in Mozart concerti, uh, hopefully to meet with the orchestra and to land together. That's the plan. Um, and and that, that's a moment of, of real improvising and real risk-taking because the further you go, the more route you have to... And the more presumably you have to keep in your head where, where it is that you want to yes, land and, and where and how. So, so we've, we've, heard you, we've heard you improvising around, around music by Bach, but, but I'm sure you're not always improvising around Bach. It might be much no. simpler things or different things or, or even things that you made up yourself. Yes, which is... Uh, Can we talk about that a bit? Maybe give us an example of, of what goes on under the bonnet when you're... Okay, so I will take myself into the start of the cooking. But, uh, you know, another facet of improvisation you mentioned before, getting out of a situation you very much wanted not to see yourself in, is also mm. actually a, a part of it. And... But the very first time I played a concerto, I just finished my studies. It was Mozart 4 8 A major, this divine, uh, which is how it goes, but that's not what I did. I did this, uh, which was no fun. Uh, and I have no idea how and why. I didn't know by then anything from what I was looking for later, but I heard myself doing then this. No idea why and how. So and something came to your rescue and, and you, you turned it back to where There was an again. angel who was bored enough not to have anything else to do and <laughs> slipped my finger, I don't know. I know that I survived the rest of the concerto and I, my plan was to quickly escape before people come and lynch me and I wasn't quick enough and people came towards me and I, I, I was sure that I was going to hear something like, we wish you all the best in your next profession. <laughs> uh, but people asked me, which edition are you using? <laughs> 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 which, which was a 
which was a powerful moment, of course. But OK, so I will try and, and do that and uh, start uh, a classically shaped or structured melody um, in the form of, of call and response. Uh, would you like to suggest a key? B flat. Uh, let's call that a theme. I played it very safe. I stayed within the expected harmonies. And if we want to play it less safe and I throw myself, I don't know where. That's very far from home. Not even stylistically very smooth. And now I have to deal with it. So... Having, having the skills and the experience to be able to get out of trouble or get back from a difficult place or something. Difficult, I but think. sometimes you want it to be difficult. Sometimes when you, you develop, want, yes. after the, 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 you expose the theme as it is naively, the story, if the story continues for a bit longer, it has to have some drama or, or, or something or more some, interesting. Some jeopardy or something. Yes. So, so there's, there's some sort of, some sense about putting yourself out into a difficult place deliberately. Yes. The story, not myself, yes, the story. Yes, the story, okay. And I mean, I think there are, there are parallels there in the, in the medical world where, where you, the more experienced you get, I, I think, the more comfortable you are at feeling that you can get out of what you've got into. And that's very helpful if you're dealing with things like the example I showed earlier of trauma surgery where you really don't know what you're going to find. It's also helpful though when if things go wrong and uh, maybe you make a mistake and, and then you're more comfortable that you can, that you can recover from it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think when you see people who are particularly, who have become very expert, that's one of the things they can do, isn't it, is that they, they have that confidence of being able to handle it, whatever it is. Yes. Um, and I, I, to me that's one of, the, one of the interesting sort of similarities between improvising music and improvising medicine mm. is, that, is that confidence to get out of trouble, but also the, the willingness that that confidence gives to, to take the yes and, yes and a yes. bit further yes. from, from what, you're, what you start off with. It's a positive self-enhancing mm. uh, dynamics, mm. and yeah. that's really a joy. The, 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 the other thing that we haven't talked about is, is going back to your example um, with that cello duo, you, you weren't looking at one another, but you were clearly attending very closely to what was going on. And I, I, I thought that's an interesting one, that, that, that moving your attentional focus from yourself and can I remember the right notes or can I remember the right procedure to do surgically to, to having enough capacity to place your focus on what's happening in the situation as a whole. And where does it go? That's where the moment where we start to telepathize, right. which I think is similar to the, this amazing example you showed mm -hmm. with the surgeon and his main uh, senior assistant handing him the scissors without even... Yes. Because she knew that that's the next yes. thing he wants. And that's, that's why these uh, you know, improvised preludes and interludes with, with Thomas Carroll succeeded because we... we had a, a genuine mind really. So you must have had an understanding because presumably you weren't thinking uh, now I'm going to play a B flat or something. You, no. you, you were just listening to one another and and it was happening at a different at a different level rather like the, the surgical example of the passing the scissors. Yes, we, we heard dynamics of tension release and often tension no release, tension and more tension and even more tension and then when you didn't expect it 
you know, yeah. suddenly to, yeah. uh, yes. So, so you, you said at the beginning, though, that you did decide where you were going to finish up, on what note. But you didn't say how you, how you decided when you were going to finish up. Yes, and that's the logic of, which is to a large extent intuitive, of a storytelling. The length of an improvised short prelude or, or, or large-scale sonata depends on what have you got to say. Mm. If you keep playing and you haven't got anything mm. to say, it's finished. That, that's, that's the end of it. So it, it's as long as the story keeps developing. Yeah, and I think, I think that goes back from, from my experience too to, to the medical side to, to seeing the consultation, say, as an evolving story. And it needs to get to a point maybe of resolution, but certainly a point of having moved things on to a satisfactory point at which you can leave it yes. um, in order to pick it up again perhaps on yes. another occasion. But it needs to have got somewhere further than it started. Um, and, and in a way, all that medical knowledge and those skills, are, that all has to be there. But, but it only really makes sense for the person it's all about, which is the patient you're with at that moment, if you've managed somehow to move it further on. Absolutely. Uh, the equivalent is, is the dimensions of the internal music, of the harmonic zones in relation to the, the tension release events mm. before. Mm. If it was a huge, massive, tensed area, you can't just uh, boom, boom, finish and, and, and go. You, you have to prepare it. Well... I mean, in a sense, this, this conversation is an improvisation of that kind, isn't it? We're, we're, we're sort of um, making, making um, the story to one as it another goes and, and yeah. respond to them. And, and like all stories, they, they have to come to an end at, at some stage, and ours is, is sort of um, the end is, is hoving too. But I thought just before we finish, could you, could you give us another musical example, perhaps of a, of a, a simple tune that people might know or, or something that okay. would um, just, just sort of capture what we've been talking about? Um, so again, I will I will just uh, share with you the, the the cooking process. If uh, I don't know, uh, we mentioned you, you or someone mentioned three blind mice. Um, I'm not sure if it was me, but <laughs> sorry, I'm not sure if it was me, but let's go with three blind mice. <laughs> okay, uh, so again, the the conventional, comfortable way. And one way would be to start something more flamboyant, but within very safe... Uh Etc. Et but you, you can also invite yourself to look for troubles by it can now take a very long time if I, I make it chromatically and and so that these are the crossroads when it comes to harmonic tension that you build forward or bring back that shape the length when to finish the story well I, I don't think I shall ever think about three blind mice in quite the same way <laughs> again <laughs> That, um, that's that's the exercise. And I yeah. think that's one of the things about improvisation, isn't it? Is that it allows you to see things that you haven't thought of in things that you thought you knew. It it, yes. it sort of shines a new light very often on yes. on things that you had taken for granted, perhaps, or you assumed that you knew. And it seems to me, from our conversation, that um, that the improvisational element of both music and medicine not only requires um, it requires a great deal of skill, it requires a lot of experience 
and confidence, but it also requires, or it also provides that opportunity to see new things and to, to yes. breathe new life into something that could become rather samey, but actually the improvisation makes it always fresh. And, and it's a new. huge danger that we musicians need to make sure we avoid yes. of going into automatic pilot, because most of us are very comfortable instrumentally, and you yeah. can just... Uh... And I think going into automatic pilot is something that goes with the territory of becoming expert in anything. There is that temptation, perhaps, to go into automatic pilot, but improvisation shakes us out of it. So yes. I, think, I think that's a good point at which to leave it, because we want to leave a little bit of time for questions. So um, perhaps, well, first of all, big thank you to, uh, thank you. to you for taking part. Um, and... Um,